Lauren Welcher with Central Alabama Voice, and we are doing a segment with Scott Hardy on the people's voice. This um, interview is going to be based around everything going on right now in regards to George Floyd and the rioting, the protest, um, kind of everything that evolves around what actually took place with George Floyd that's kind of rolled us into where we are now. Um, so I'll let you kind of introduce who you are, what you do. Yeah, uh, my name is Scott Hardy and I am Alexander City's District 3 City Councilman. And outside of that, I also work for a consulting firm as well, like based out of Montgomery. So uh, thank you guys for having me. Today. Yeah, thank you. So um, first off, we'll start the conversation with a real easy one for me, which is, do you feel like right now that people in your position or in higher positions than even you are doing enough speaking out about racism itself or about um, the protest, where they stand, what they feel like is going to make change ultimately. Uh, what, where do you stand on that? I think in a situation like this, if you have the platform to be able to um, relay your opinion to the people, especially those that put you in office, mm -hmm. I think you're responsible to do so. So from a local level, I think that it's things like this are really hyper local. So as a city councilman, there's more things I think you can do to help combat situations like this, whether it be uh, from a city council perspective, we appoint the police chief. So as the police chief is appointed, then that means that he's hiring a police officer. So being engaged with that process, and I'm very happy to say that uh, Chief Jay Turner, who is Alexander City's police chief, he and I have worked together for, since I've been in office, which uh, was 2016. Uh, we have worked together to try to increase the amount of black officers that were on the police force. And so we've had great success with that. Anytime there's a new opening happening uh, that's available for the police department, he reaches out to me. And so anybody that I've seen him has been hired. So I think that's the first thing so that, and hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about this later, but I think that that makes voting mm -hmm. even more important because then the people you're putting in office are the people who are making the laws. So that means you can, and they're also the people interpreting the laws Correct. and prosecuting the laws. So, and get better judges, better district attorneys, better council members who have ultimately put better people on the streets to protect and serve. Gotcha. I was actually talking to another guy the other day and um, we were talking about something that kind of stood out to me in regards to what you just said. Um, but we were talking about how the white community and what, what the white community can do to, I guess, um, allow the black community to feel like there is change being made or that we're making an effort for change. And one of the good points that he made, which is kind of where you were going with trying to put different people um, in different positions that are not of the same color, um, but it was a conversation that went along with that. It was, um, he, he made a statement saying that, who are the top five people that are in your phone that you talk to every day? And um, I said, well, you know, there's a few people. And he's like, well, who are the ones with those stars by their name? That kind of your favorites. And he said, are any of those people a black person? And he said, you know, this could easily go back on myself included. And he said, are any of mine a white person? And he said, I say that because when you're talking to people that are not looking just like you, that don't act just like you, that don't do the same things that you do, then those people become a friend. And he said, ultimately, when a law is made or a bill is passed or something in your town is going on a tax increase, he said, you're gonna to have to think of a friend when you think of going to vote for that change. And so that made a lot of sense to me that if I'm talking to the same people that look just like me, act like me, or in the same position that I'm in, they have the same income that I do, um, you know, at the end of the day, I'm only thinking about people that are just like me when I go to vote for something. And so that kind of goes back to what you were saying there is putting people in roles that are ultimately prosecuting and they're doing all those things is that we kind of have to go out from our narrow mindset and myself included is, you know, make sure that we're talking to people, not even really in relation to only race 
but people that don't have the same ideals that we do because we're going to always go through life with that same narrow mindset and you know ultimately this world that we live in is so diverse and it's not the decisions that are being made and the things that are going on in our town and our country are not just based around what Lauren needs and what Lauren wants. It, it's got to be for the betterment of our whole community. So I think that that's a great way of putting it. And I will say this, I think when it, in terms of the voting aspect, there is a responsibility to look out for yourself to an extent. I mean, you should, I feel at times people vote against their self-interest, mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, there are things that are happening that you may not see it impacting you directly, mm -hmm. but the domino effect of how some of these, how some of the legislation that is passed, both on the state and federal level, how that's going to impact communities as a whole. So whether that is minimum wage or right. whether that is um, with dealing with the prison system. So there are different things where if you're putting the same type of people in office, then you're going to always get the same type that's of right. mindset and the same results. But um, for me, I think it's important when you, you kind of were touched on about what can, in somebody in your shoes, how can you impact change or how can you bring something to the table? For me, I think it's just this. Uh, right now, I think that what the situation with George Floyd, and I mean, there's multiple instances of this happening with whether it's Tamir Rice or uh, Brianna uh, Taylor, uh, Walter Scott, there's different people who have been impacted by this, by nothing, or who were killed essentially for nothing other than the color of their skin. So this is something that has been brewing for a while. And for all of the things that can be negatively said about social media, the movement that's happening now is directly related to social, social media because nobody, without that tape, nobody sees what happens. So I think that that's the biggest thing is opening people's eyes. And when you look at a situation like this, I'm 32 years old. My parents are in the early 60s, so they went through school where they were segregated then ultimately got integrated in. My age group never had to deal with that. So there's certain things where I think that our exposure level to community or to our peers that don't necessarily look like us or think like us is how you create this change. So when you're talking about how can you impact it, just listening, and that goes for both sides. Maybe, they, maybe as a uh, black male, people won't see the same way that I do. But on the flip side, I can see maybe why you're concerned about certain things, not you, but somebody that doesn't look like me. So I think ultimately it falls upon us, as people that look like me, to make sure that we are explaining why we're upset, why we're frustrated, why we're sad, why we're mad, why we're hurt. And on the same side, for you to listen, truly open your eyes, ears, and hearts to understand where that is and show the empathy that's needed at this time. Yeah. and. I was actually talking the other day in conversation with somebody and the way that you said that was goes back to this is it's kind of like if I go home to my husband and I say, well, you should have known that was going to make me mad. And then he says, but I didn't know because you've never told me. And he, he says, well, now I know. So now I won't do that again. That's the same concept here is that if we're not opening our ears to listen and you're not educating us, then there is no change. Um, and so it's kind of like, it's a give and take in this situation. And another good point is, I feel like right now, it's almost like in the white community, and I could be talking just myself, or this could be a lot of people's mindset that's actually not coming out of their mouth. But I feel like a lot of it is, the white community too wants to speak out of how they feel and in, in, you know, standing up for the black community. But I feel like it's a lot of in fear of saying the wrong thing. So for instance, you know, where, you know, of course I'm scrolling through Facebook and somebody says black person, and then a black person comments back and says, well, I'd actually be, want to be called person of color, or I'd actually rather be termed African American. And so at that point, it's like the white person ultimately draws away from the conversation itself and then there's no real solution because you're immediately offended and so you stop the conversation and you don't actually work towards an ultimate goal which is figuring out how to get rid of racism so i think the thing now is like 
I feel like the white community, and again, I could be talking just for myself. It's like, I want to, I want to speak out. I want to stand with you, but I know I'll never be able to understand where you are, where you've been and how you've walked in these, these shoes. Cause I'll never have walked in those, but it's like, I don't want to offend because we're all coming at it with, I say all myself I'm coming at it with a good heart with all the good intentions, but we don't want to offend. So where do you kind of feel in that? Well, I'll say this. I think that race relations in general are in a microcosm reflective of how our country is right now. It's divided either on this side or that side. Mm -hmm. And so this country outside of race relations, for the most part, has always been able to converse with another person and there was debate that was had, and that's what made our country what it was, was bringing different ideas to the table. Now, when it comes to race relations, obviously this is something that's very uncomfortable a lot of times to talk about, because as you said, you don't necessarily know the right thing to say, but on the flip side, for me, I'm looking at it and just say something. So, like, I, I and it depends yeah. who you're speaking to, right? I understand that, but I think the engagement between both communities while it can be uncomfortable, the only way to take that next step would be to get through this uncomfortableness, get the dialogue going, mm-hmm. but it can't just be when you see a murder on TV or if somebody is shot by two men in a truck. It can't just be then. Like Obviously, that's something that should infuriate right. everyone, but now that we've got everybody's attention, which is what the protests are doing now, this is simply, and I don't condone the rioting and the destruction of property, but the actual protests themselves or to get your attention. Mm-hmm. Now that we've got your attention, now it's now we're telling you why we're doing what we're doing. Correct. And I think that's the biggest thing is, okay, you may not like what I have to say, and I may not like what you have to say, but at the end of the day, having this conversation will ultimately be the catalyst for the change that we're trying to see. And again, it goes back to me, I think using your voice, not only in the streets, but using it in the voting booth as well. Mm-hmm. If you have an issue with something that's happening, get different people in office. So, I mean, you have to get a dim- different demographic of people right. in there to create the change that you're looking for. At the same time for us, people are starting to have, my age are starting to have kids or people young may having kids. So how you raise your children will also be reflective of what's coming in the future. So there is no excuse. We didn't go through integration. We didn't have to do boycott. We didn't have to do certain things that our parents or grandparents may have had to do. So now the two biggest, I think, factors for I would say, yeah, facts, I think, in getting this change, two avenues are education and sports. Sports provides an opportunity, which is why I think youth league sports are very imperative for your kids to be involved in some type of activity because it gets them out of their bubble that they're in, both cultures, mm-hmm. gets them out of their bubble and they're exposed to different things. That's something, from my perspective, I thought my parents did an excellent job on, of that, was my exposure level to different types of people which then broadened my horizons of what I thought people should be. So now, you're talking about the five people thing. I think that's a very, I heard somebody say something similar to that. I think that that is important. Mm -hmm. And not necessarily saying you have to just try to make friends to be making friends, but your kids grow up together, you play sports together, then at some point it stops. So Mm -hmm. what is, where is that point where it stops? So that's where we have to look at it from there. And again, as a five, if you go to a playground, if you go to Jim Pearson, Jacob Slatter, any, Woody Woodpecker, anybody that is doing mm-hmm. child care, you know, you've got three, four, five, six-year-old kids there. They don't know that they're not playing with somebody that doesn't look like them. No. So for that to be an issue for them, that means it was taught to them by their parents or somebody right. in their family or a friend group or whatever it may be. So racism is not something that's innate. It's something that's taught. So yeah. I think that ultimately it falls upon our age group. This is, we're a generation of, of change. I really believe that. So you've seen it all across the spectrum. And the more that we call people out on what it is, uh, my grandfather always used to say, if you want something done, ask somebody. If you want it done right, do it yourself. So if you see that something needs to be done, do it yourself. Don't yeah. like, I think that that's very important now. And I, I think you're seeing, it. if you look at the diversity of the crowds, mm-hmm. you're seeing people of all backgrounds, all racial, uh, classifications are coming together for one thing oh and I hate that it's taken this amount of time Yeah, but I think that you're going to see significant change going forward but again the conversation can't just 
excuse me, can't end with this. It has to be continuous. And I think that um, as our community, while it does have its issues, like any other community, as a whole, I think everyone is trying to put their best foot forward to figure out how we can create that unification that we're looking for. I do too. And I was watching a live uh, the other day when we did our peaceful protest. I say our because it was in our community. Um, but the live feed was so inspiring because you saw just as many white people there as you did black people. And just as many, um, even I say elderly, but mature white people that stood up and they said, I was raised in the time where it was segregated and I don't stand for that. And here's where I am and I want to know how I can help. I want to be educated on what I can do to allow you all to feel like we are one. And just like you said, you know, back in my granddad's generation, all of that was taught, but now it's like unteaching it. So, you know, it's going back to the drawing board, sitting down with your children and, and saying, this is not okay. You know, just like the other day I was talking with somebody and they said, oh, your daughter's such a great sleeper. Mine wasn't born to sleep great. Well, they're not born to know how to sleep either. So... You know, at seven o'clock every night when we sit down and we put our clothes on and we take our bath and we rub her down with lotion, in her mind she's thinking, oh, I do this every night at seven, so it's cueing me to go to bed. And so we're teaching that. Just like we taught that, we've got to teach that we don't say that word. You don't do that. You hang out with just with everybody. It's not this person goes here and this person goes there because the sad thing is, is that was taught. And sadly, it's still being taught. And if you see that going on, like you said, you've got to stand up and say, this isn't okay. And if you're okay with that, then I'm not okay with being your friend. I'm not okay with, you know, associating with you. And having the, the guts to stand up for something you truly do believe in is wrong. Um, another thing that I wanted to kind of touch on with you that was interesting in conversation with me the other day um, interesting and emotional, to be honest, um, is a good question, I feel like, and you probably have a good perspective on it, um, but what, what conversations do you feel like you had in your home growing up that maybe a white family did not have to have in their home? For instance, one of the answers that I got was, and, and all of this kind of comes to my mind and I'm like, well, you know, that sounds exactly like a conversation that somebody of color would have in their home. But it was so emotional for me because I have a young child that I, I feel like I would never have to explain to her why her skin tone or her skin color would make her have to feel that way in life. But the guy said, you know, my parents always told me, if I get pulled over, 10 and two. Don't ever reach for your license. Don't ever reach for your insurance card. Because in their minds, you're reaching for a gun. And that was very emotional for me to hear that because as a white person, that never really goes through my mind. When I get pulled over, I'm just like, let me get all my stuff out. So what what was some, what were some things that you felt like conversation-wise you had at your home? Now, I'll say this, like going back to my comment before, because of my upbringing, my exposure to people that didn't share my same color was pretty relevant, relevant growing up. So my exposure to those people created a comfort level for me that maybe people that I grew up with didn't have that same comfort level. Yeah. But at the same time, your peer groups or uh, your financial status or whatever that may be doesn't stop you from having to or some of the same things. So mine may not have been to the extent of others, yeah. but it was there. But to answer your question, I mean, that, there is a conversation that as a black male, you're almost going to have to have, somebody's gonna have this talk with you, whether it's your mother, your father, somebody older that you consider a mentor, whatever it may be, is going to give you the talk. That yeah. That's what's been seen. And that is not hyperbole, that is real. That's a conversation when you get pulled over, this is how you handle it. You go into a store, just certain things that when you step out of the door, there's certain things that, that you're thinking, that I'm thinking about that the person sitting next to me may not have to ever deal with. And that's not to say that in this community is prevalent. And that, right. But 
there are places where if I got out of this bubble, my comfort level decreases. And so that's something that I didn't understand because my, I, I love police. Bro. I mean, yeah, it's yeah. Weird, not weird, but like we always used to watch Andy Griffith. So oh, I, yeah. like that was my interpretation Happy of police. Days. Yes, that was what my interpretation of police were. And so I have family members who are police now, and we have this conversation. You know, it, as a black male, if you're a black police officer, there's a certain responsibility you have to to make sure the things that you don't want to have happen, you have to be, you have to do that as well, but at the same time, you have to do the job. So there's a fine line there. And in the yeah. political arena, it's the same thing. Um, right is right, wrong is wrong at yeah. the end of the day. But there are conversations that are being had in certain households that aren't have being had in others. And at some point, I'd like to see it get to the point where that's no longer a thought process. You yeah. get pulled over, you just get pulled, pulled over. over. And it is scary at times. I travel a lot from just being open about it. There are, I have to travel to some places where the relationship between the black and white uh, communities are not that great. And so I worry if I get stopped here, what's going to happen? And so at the end of the day, I think you just have to take the precautions necessary to protect yourself. But I heard it put pretty well this morning. And it's exhausting. I said that's one way that I, I can say it. at times it gets exhausting having to toe the line, so to speak, where others may not have to do so. But the if you're raising a black child, informing them enough so that they're cognizant and aware of what's happening, but not to the point of increasing their anxiety or fearfulness, that's a fine line. There. So you want them to be able to understand that yes, the police are here to help you. But at the same time, you know, there's certain things that you may have to do differently. So there, you have to toe the line there and create that balance. But uh, as a whole, I think that, again, it just falls back to what's being done in your household. Because now, I think that our generation was the start. And you'll see two to three generations down, I, I could really see where you would have some type of significant change. Mm-hmm. And it started with the 60s with the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act and Martin Luther King's movement and what he was doing. And the next generation took a different step forward. The next generation elected a black president. The next group will be the group that says, all right, now we're just, we're done. Yeah. Like, hey, That's we're, 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 we're moving forward. Yeah. I think that you're seeing it. I've been very pleased to see some of the people that I've gone to school with or I interact with say some of the things that they've said and removing their fearfulness of losing or upsetting somebody in their family or losing a friendship by being outspoken. And the way that I've explained it, I had somebody reach out to me about it and I said, you know, if that person can't respect the fact that this is what you believe in is standing for, then y'all want that close to friends anyway. Sure. Um, but it's been really comforting to see the people that I interact with on a consistent basis really reach out to me and say, you know what, I, I don't know what you're going through, mm-hmm. but I want to be there for you to do it. So whatever yeah. we got to do going forward, let me know. So um, I think we're, we're moving in the right direction, but again, don't let this just be a today thing or tomorrow thing, next week thing. It has to be continuous. So not necessarily the protest. And I, I agree with what's happening there. I think it's gotten the nation's attention, yeah. the world's attention. Uh, but I think we're, we're headed in the right direction. Yeah, a good way that I heard it talked about the other day was um, the protests were were started and put into place with the rioting and the looting, even though that seemed so elaborate. But it was kind of like Martin Luther King said, you know, rioting is the language of the unheard. And so it's almost like that extent, even though sad that it took that much um, it did grab the attention, but now it's like, where's the message? Let's let's put the message, and then let's hope and pray that there is a change. But ultimately, like Caleb and I were talking the other day, we kind of live in a world where we want instant gratification. And so it's like, we all think, all races, all kinds, think that, you know, okay, well, we did this, so 
good job, attaboy, and tomorrow we're going to wake up and it's a new day. We're back to happy days. But it's not, and it took many years of teaching racism, and it's going to take a little while to unteach it. And so, um, you know, I think truly, I agree with you, we're getting, we're getting to that point. Do I think we're going to wake up any day now and we're all going to just be singing each other's praises and everything's going to be lollipops and gumdrops? No, but um, I think we're making the right change and the right move. It's, it's very inspiring to see, like I said, people together at Strand Park and having conversation, open conversation, where nobody is seeming to walk in a fence. Because just like we were talking the other day, if you're looking for a reason to get offended, whether white or black, you're going to find a reason to get offended. And um, right now is just not that time. If you're making the change or you're making the, the set apart goal to stand up for what you believe in, for the same common goal, um, you know, if you get offended, that's fine. Swallow that, say, you know what, I didn't know, now I know, and let's move on um, and find the solution. So, um, I'm super excited and I think I think everything is going to ultimately play out for the common good. Of course, I'm a Christian, so I stand in that, but everything happens for a reason and God is ultimately um, be sovereign. His plan is without flaw. But um, another thing I kind of wanted to touch on is, like you said, at Jacob's Ladder, my daughter goes there and her teacher is our Lisa Groves and she literally thinks that our Lisa is God's gift to her. Um, and people will say, you know, how does, how does Randley like school? And I say the same thing every time. Our daycare teacher, and all the daycare teachers over there, but our daycare teacher is the best thing ever. And when I drop my daughter off every day, I know that she is well taken care of and she's loved. And she's a black lady. And she comes to my house and she gets in my refrigerator and she takes care of my daughter sometimes better than I think I can of her and something so intriguing to me um is the other day she watched my daughter and i put renly down for a nap and when i left our lisa came in to babysit so ultimately she was going in there to you know get her out of the crib so in my baby's mind she's like well my mom laid me down but it's not my mom getting me up and i asked our lisa you know how did she react you know, when you walked in there to get her because it was probably confusing to her. And she said she just smiled and reached up for me to grab her. And there's a lot of times that she'll say at school, she'll walk over to Arlisa, she'll raise her hands and she'll say, Mama, and she wants Arlisa to hold her. And I could take that like, well, she shouldn't be calling me Mama, I'm her Mama. But the way that I take that is she feels the same love from this lady that I extend to her, and I am her mom. And so if we can all wrap our mind around that to say, if we could just go about it with love and with kindness, and just in the same conversation, I sat here with Sean Bland, and he said, you know, when you talk about how should you address black people, people of color, African American, just address them with kindness. Address them with respect. And he said, if you can do that, I don't care. He said, it's not about making sure you're correct. You're, you know, saying the right thing at the right time. He said, but if you're treating me with love and with kindness, then at the end of the day, we can be friends. And I agree with that. I think a lot of times, kind of going back to what you were speaking about, people are afraid to say anything because they are afraid of offending someone. But the only way, just the same thing as, as a child, if as you said, with, with your husband, but if a child touches a uh, stove and it's hot, well, if they had never been told before that they were going to burn their finger, then obviously they're going to do it, they, but they learn a lesson there. Correct. And so sometimes it's an uncomfortable one, sometimes it's a painful one, but from the other side, I just think it takes looking at both perspectives. Correct. And I don't want to sit up here and seem like I'm some person who has all the answers on race, but I'm uniquely qualified, I think, to, because of what my peer group is, my upbringing, all the people that I affiliate myself with, I'm hearing it from every angle. And so, 
right now the most important thing that can be done in this country is just listening. And then really, as Sean said, using this as a time to be respectful and understanding of what's being said. No, you may not understand it, but it's hard to understand something that you're not going through. So sometimes you just have to take your word for it. I mean, I'm in a position where I can't have a baby, but I've heard that it's, it's a long process and it hurts. So, yeah. that, so I have to take your word for it that this is what it is. So yeah. how can I help that situation be better for you? Yeah. That's the same thing here is how can we help make this a better situation? And by listening and actually taking taking the, the words that have been said to you and then putting them to action. It's no longer a time for silence. I think that that's the thing. Now, I will take whatever you have to say in reason, but I'll take it now because at least you're showing interest and you're trying to be engaged in the conversation and what's being done. Mm -hmm. And ultimately for me, that's the biggest sign of respect is that you're hearing what I'm saying and you want to put those words to use. Yeah, I agree. Well, this has been Scott Harding and Lauren Welcher, and this has been Central Alabama Voice.